Often, in discussing research, we concentrate on process, on specific techniques and tools for data gathering or data analysis. While these have their place, rarely do we converse regarding why we do what we do, or how we go about determining the meaning of our findings. Together, in this session, we will endeavor to consider the larger picture, particularly contributions that the biblical worldview can provide to matters of truth value within research. We will seek to answer the questions. What is the fit between the biblical worldview and research? How does a biblical worldview inform the research paradigm and research activities? Regardless of one's philosophical or religious persuasion, there are important insights to be gained. We begin with a succinct definition of research. Research is a systematic inquiry based on gathering and analyzing information designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. Let's examine several of these concepts. First, research is inquiry. That is, we are seeking to answer important questions. The goal is knowledge. This points to the fact that we hope to describe, to understand, and ultimately to predict. We want that knowledge to be generalizable. This suggests that we would like our findings to have meaning beyond the immediate, informing other settings and scenarios. At the heart, of this knowledge-generating inquiry is a systematic process for gathering and analyzing information. This intentional and organized process uses the scientific approach, a sequence of phases, making initial observations, defining the problem, formulating the question, investigating the known, articulating an expectation, collecting and analyzing data, interpreting the results, particularly in reference to the expectation, reflecting on the findings, and then communicating the findings to the scientific community as well as to society at large, a process which we sometimes describe as the scientific method. The overarching goal then is to extend the frontiers of knowledge. That knowledge, however, should also be trustworthy, a true and accurate reflection of reality. This is why, as researchers, we seek to minimize false positives, and false negatives, and why, in qualitative research, we endeavor to triangulate. Consequently, research is ultimately a search for truth, for trustworthy knowledge. Not truth in its absolute sense, but certainly those dimensions of truth that are accessible within our human limitations. At Jesus' trial, Pilate asked a key question. What is truth? If we were to pose that question or its counterpart, how do you know when something is true? to a cross-section of contemporary society, we would encounter a range of responses. 
Well, it's been that way for a very long time. Everyone agrees it must certainly be true. It seems obvious. I feel strongly about it. It must be true. It's certainly reasonable. Look, it all fits together so beautifully. Well, she's the expert, and she surely must know. It just plain works. We recognize, however, that each of these criteria for determining truthfulness presents inherent limitations. Every tradition, for example, must have a beginning. How did that first person know that it was true? Regarding popularity, we have to ask the question, is the majority always right? There was a time, after all, when all but eight people believed that it could not rain. But it rained. And another time, nearly everyone believed in spontaneous generation, until Louis Pasteur performed his experiments demonstrating that life can only come from life. What about emotion? Well, I may feel very strongly that something is true. But what happens when two people feel strongly about the same thing, but in opposite ways? Furthermore, could emotion degenerate into mere wish fulfillment? This simply must be true because I like it and I want it to be true. How about consistency? Everything fitting together beautifully. While everything may indeed fit together perfectly, what if one started with a false premise and then ensured that each addition was a perfect match? Would that beautiful harmony then make us dead wrong. Regarding authority, we must ask, who is going to be that authority? And how do they know what is true after all? Perhaps we can empathize with the disciple Thomas who exclaimed, Lord, we don't know anything for certain. We must keep matters in perspective, however. Before any hasty attempt to discard any of these criteria, we should note that each is a value, and each can contribute toward a better understanding of truth. The point, however, is that not one of these criteria can guarantee truth. We now turn to research in our quest for trustworthy knowledge. Research is predicated on empirical evidence, and this provides the basis for one of the more pervasive truth criteria the correspondence theory. In this approach, assertions of truth are compared with evidence of reality, at least as we perceive it. This correspondence, empirical evidence approach, is frequently expressed in statements such as, it's supported by research, and it's scientifically sound. These assert that the conclusions are therefore trustworthy. Research, in fact, with its systematic 
methodology and its checks and balances, such as peer review and replication of findings, is certainly one of the more promising avenues through which we can approximate truth. Nevertheless, we would be naive if we did not also recognize the limitations of research, several of which are highlighted in Scripture. Do we truly perceive what is out there? Or could it be that we see through a glass darkly, as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13? Another limitation is that appearances at times can be deceiving. Optical illusions and the Doppler effect are examples of this limitation. Another key limitation is that data must be interpreted to become meaningful. For example, if we look at the cylinder from the left, it will look like a circle as demonstrated by the shadow on the right wall. But if we look at it from the right, it will appear as a square, as evidenced by the shadow on the left wall. And to complicate matters, if we modify the object to become a cylindrical wedge, we now have three perspectives. From the left, it appears as a triangle, from the right as a square, and from the top as a circle. Fundamentally then, interpretation is influenced by our frame of reference, our vantage point, our lens through which we view the world around us and through which we interpret data. It is possible then for people to review the same data and yet arrive at quite different interpretations because of differences in worldview. A case in point is found in Numbers chapter 13. Twelve individuals are sent to assess the land of Canaan. Each of these twelve persons reviews the same evidence and they return with a similar sample. Yet two arrive at a conclusion quite different from that of the other ten. Finally, is all the evidence ever in? Might we know only in part? And this partial knowledge lead us to faulty conclusions. What then is the answer? How do we know what is truth? Regrettably, the clamor of the crowd distracted Pilate, and he turned away before Jesus could answer the question, what is truth? As is often the case with God, however, Christ had, in fact, answered Pilate's question before it was asked, when he stated in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Accordingly, for the Christian, truth is a person. Furthermore, hours before his encounter with Pilate, Christ had prayed, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. In the biblical worldview, therefore, the word, whether written or incarnate, is truth. This implies that obtaining a knowledge of the truth is both intellectual and a relational process. Intellectual, learning about God, His words, and His works. And relational, knowing Christ personally and experientially. What are the implications of this perspective for research and specifically for one who engages in research? There are at least six fundamental concepts. First, truth begins 
with God, not with humankind. James writes, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. And John adds, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Consequently, human beings are but receivers of God's revelation of truth. Although we can construct interpretations or applications of truth, we do not ultimately create truth. This does not imply, however, that we are merely passive recipients. Rather, God desires that we actively discover and at times recover truth. Second, because truth resides in God and God does not change, truth is stable. This is affirmed in Scripture. First of all, the Bible speaks of the God of truth and asserts that truth is in Jesus. Furthermore, Scripture also states that God is eternal and unchanging, with affirmations such as these, I am the Lord. I do not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As a result, God's truth is constant. As David confirmed, the truth of the Lord endures forever. Consequently, human beings cannot destroy truth. We can only choose to accept or reject God's truth. The fact that truth cannot be destroyed also suggests that those who have accepted it do not need to shift into crisis mode simply because truth has been attacked. As Ellen White notes, knowing that the advocates of error cannot create or destroy truth, those who have the sanctifying power of the truth upon their heart can afford to be calm and considerate. Furthermore, this concept of the stability of truth implies that the principles of God's truth are generalizable across time, place, and case. Psalm 100 verse 5, for instance, states that God's truth endures to all generations. This does not mean that the application of truth cannot vary depending on the context, but rather that truth in its principle is universal. Third, all truth possesses unity because it comes from the same source. We already noted that coherence cannot establish truth given that we might start with a false assumption. Thus, not all that is consistent is true. Nevertheless, that which is true is internally consistent, and truth will be in harmony with itself wherever and whenever it is found. Consequently, research findings should evidence a good fit with other instances of truth. If there seems to be a contradiction, there is error. In terms of what we have just discovered, or perhaps what we previously regarded as truth. Alternatively, both declarations could be true, or potentially both false, with the apparent contradiction denoting a problem with our finite understanding and serving as a call for further study and reflection. In essence, 
the unity of truth calls us to review the literature, to replicate studies, to seek goodness of fit, and to triangulate. Fourth, truth is infinite because God is infinite. Because we are finite, we will never fully comprehend or exhaust the extent of God's truth. As a result, the frontiers of our understanding are also the horizons of our ignorance. Visually, our circle of knowledge is surrounded by the vast universe of what we do not know, or much less understand. Our only contact with that universe, however, is at the perimeter of our circle. Beyond those unknowns that touch the circumference of our circle of knowledge, we don't even know that we don't know. When the circle of knowledge is small, the circumference is also small, and we touch only a few things that we do not know. And we might be led to believe that we know almost everything. However, as the area of the circle grows through learning and research, so does the circumference, and our points of contact with the unknown thereby increase. As a result, the more we learn, the more we realize how much there is yet to learn and the more humble we should become. Fifth, we must continually grow in our knowledge and understanding of truth. It is not sufficient to stand anchored in the truth. According to scripture, we must walk in the truth. The act of walking denotes movement and progress. Ellen White writes, Let no one come to the conclusion that there is no more truth to be revealed. How presumptuous it would be then for anyone on that journey to declare or act as if he or she possesses all truth. As Christians, we will never possess all truth. After all, God's truth is infinite and we are finite. Nevertheless, through study, research, and experience, through collaboration with other truth seekers and divine guidance, the proportion of error should begin to drop away with the ultimate goal that all the Christian possesses should be truth. Sixth, because God is the source of all truth, all truth is ultimately God's truth. Augustine asserted early on, let every good and true Christian understand that wherever truth may be found, it belongs to his master. If something is true, even if it is the truth about the untruth, it is an extension of God's truth, and we must recognize that connection. In the Christian perspective, this is a core purpose of research and of education, highlighting the link between discovered truth and its source. While we recognize that all truth is a manifestation of God's ultimate truth, we must also acknowledge that Christians do not have a monopoly on truth. Non-believers also discover truths. 
And this is because God causes his sun to shine on all types of persons and sends rain on those who do right and those who do not, in order that all might come to a knowledge of the truth. We should not be surprised, therefore, if agnostics or even atheists discover important facets of God's truth. Is there a difference, then, between the Christian and the non-Christian? While the non-Christian can encounter truth in his or her journey through life, the Christian acknowledges and values the source of that truth. The questions, how do we obtain truth? How do we attain trustworthy knowledge are particularly relevant within the context of research. Fundamentally, we are enabled to discover truth because God takes the initiative, proactively sharing facts and principles with us. There are a number of aspects involved. Divine revelation is the channel through which God reveals truth to human beings. Our reasoning powers, as well as the ability to conduct research and to reflect on knowledge and experience, are gifts from God that enable us to discover and understand truth. Faith, in turn, is a sincere and wholehearted commitment to God's manifestation of truth. We may visualize it this way. Divine revelation is the point of departure. This divine revelation includes both the Word of God, special revelation, as well as the works of God, general revelation. Consequently, both Scripture and the creation are avenues intentionally used by God to communicate. Reason, research, and reflection Nevertheless, each play a key role, enabling us to apprehend God's revelation and understand its meaning. Meanwhile, faith is integral to the entire process. St. Anselm in the Proslogion states, I seek not to understand in order that I may believe but I believe in order that I may understand. For this also I believe, namely, that unless I believe, I shall not understand. In essence, all persons live by faith, regardless of their worldview, as there are always fundamental assumptions that cannot be tested by reason, research, or reflection to the point of certainty. The matter, ultimately, is in what or in whom we will place our faith. There is a problem, however, in Romans 1, Paul speaks of those who change the truth of God into a lie. How can this be? How can truth be changed into a lie? While God's truth cannot be destroyed, it can, in fact, be distorted. When an object is viewed through a warped lens, our perception of that object is deformed, although the object itself has not changed. How does this misrepresentation of truth occur? There are at least two possibilities. First, it can result from Satan's direct manipulation of God's truth. An example of this manipulation of truth is found in the book of Acts. As we went to prayer, Luke writes, a certain slave girl, possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, 
who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did this day after day. Finally, Paul turned one day and rebuked the Spirit, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And the evil spirit came out that very hour. Given that the slave girl's assertion, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation, was true. Why did Paul utter his rebuke? Simply because the devil was endeavoring to distort God's truth. The inhabitants of Philippi knew this woman well. After all, she brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. As the woman seemed to know these strangers and was providing pro bono marketing services for many days, people could falsely conclude that they belonged to the same endeavor, and that was a distortion of truth. Another, and perhaps more subtle way in which truth can be distorted is through our acceptance of a secular worldview, a perspective which removes God from the equation. As Paul describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So, there are two insidious forces that attack our understanding of God's truth. Satan's direct manipulation and a worldview that eliminates God from the reckoning. The net result in either case is that we arrive at false conclusions regarding God's revelation of truth. This is tragic. Is there no remedy? Is there no solution? The good news is that God is again proactive. He provides the Spirit of truth who will guide us into all truth. The Holy Spirit, in fact, is given to deflect Satan's attempted distortions of truth and to rescue us from the false assumptions of a secular worldview. As a result, we are enabled to arrive at correct conclusions regarding God and His truth. As the prophet Isaiah wrote, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Consequently, it is essential for a Christian to invite the Holy Spirit as a partner in research. There is an additional safeguard, however, and that is the triangulation of believers, a triangulation within the community of faith. While popularity polls do not determine truth, nevertheless, Scripture states that every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. A case in point, when the early Christian believers needed to decide which matters were essential, as recorded in Acts 15. They came together, discussed, and prayed, and under the guidance of the Spirit, reached a conclusion. In research, it is likewise necessary that findings be replicated, that perspectives be triangulated, and that through humble interactions, a consensus emerge among those who are committed to a biblical 
worldview. As researchers, we hold certain core beliefs. Beliefs that emerge from the biblical worldview. We hold that research is a focused and systematic search for truth, for trustworthy knowledge and understanding. Truth, for its part, loses nothing by close examination, by careful investigation. Further, both reason and faith can be strengthened by the scrutiny of research and refined in the crucible of empirical analysis. On the other hand, we must acknowledge that research has inherent limitations, that not even a careful application of scientific inquiry is a guarantee of truth. Although we endeavor to safeguard the truthfulness of our conclusions, we recognize that we cannot arrive at certainty based on empirical data. Consequently, we can never state, research has proved, or science has verified. Rather, we must speak in terms of evidence that bears witness to the truth. Therefore, as researchers, we must each model authenticity and humility. This includes recognizing the limits of our knowledge, being honest about our deficiencies, and expressing the tentativeness of our conclusions. It implies openness to correction and a passion for continued growth. It suggests that as believing scholars, we must come together under the guidance of the Spirit to build a dynamic word-based community in search of truth. There is a final matter. Paul writes, Wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they have refused to love the truth. It is not enough to know the truth. We must love the truth. And what does it mean to love the truth? To love the truth is to live the truth. We evidence that we love the truth by incorporating it into the fabric of our lives. The result? The truth shall make you free. We do not so much need freedom to discover truth as we must reside in God's truth to progressively experience freedom. Freedom from error, from false assumptions, and from misplaced interpretations. Truth, in fact, offers the only freedom. At the end of Earth's history, God proclaims, Open the gates that the righteous nation who keeps the truth may enter in. In the final analysis, Truth matters.